The Boy of the Painted Cave, Chapters 10 and 11. Chapter 10 A full moon passed and another began and it was almost summer. Whenever Tao left the little cave to go hunting with Ram, he looked out over the valley to be sure that Bolt or Garth and the other hunters were not around. Now he looked across the verdant grasslands, warm and bright in the early morning sunlight. He saw noisy flocks of dusty brown linnets fly over the meadows, settling at times to rest and feed, then rising up again like a tawny cloud. Small bands of horses grazed alongside sagai antelopes as they wandered across the open fields, but this morning Tao saw no man, no hunter. Everything seemed quiet and at peace. Then he saw something far off in the distance. He strained his eyes, but he could make it out only as a long line of great brown bodies moving slowly. It came out of the bottomlands, along the river, rolling ponderously onto the plains. Tao knew it was a vast herd of animals, but he could not yet see it clearly. Sometimes it was hidden by a white haze of dust that hovered over it, moving along with it. Then it came into view again, a living thing winding its way along. It was still far away, but it was getting closer. Tao held his hand up to his forehead, shielding his eyes from the sun. He looked again. He gasped and felt his heart leap. <gasps> They're here, Ram, he cried. The mountains that walk have come back. He picked up his spear and went down the cliff, stumbling, sliding to the bottom with Ram close behind him. Without stopping, they ran across. They ran out across the valley, racing through the knee-high grass, scattering the game before them. The antelopes went bounding away. The horses whinnied and galloped off. Breathing heavily, the boy and the wolf dog plunged headlong into the swamps. Here, they would be downwind from the animals. They could hide in the tall reed grass and watch in safely. Standing in the shallow water, they waited silently as the first groups of mammoths slumbered into the open meadow. Tao pushed aside the reeds to get a better view. He could see the herd clearly now. It was made up of cows with many yearlings and calves. As tall as the birch trees, some of the older elephant-like animals had long sweeping trunks that curved inward, almost crossing over at the ends. Thick hanging mats of reddish-brown hair covered their bodies all shaggy and disheveled from late spring shedding. The calves wandered on either side of the herd, exploring, romping, then running back. Great black-winged vultures soared overhead, circling the herd. Tao counted on his fingers. It was three summers since the mountains that walked had come through the valley. Now they were back, and Tao was overwhelmed at the sight of them. All of the animals in the valley, he loved to watch the animals that walk best. They were like the earth, massive, shaggy old giants lumbering out of the dawn. Moving slowly in scattered groups, the monsters plodded along, pulling up great trunkfuls of grass, bending down the willows and birch trees to get at the succulent bug, buds and twigs. Tao was still downwind from the animals. Never had he seen so many, never had he been so near to the gigantic beasts. They were so close he could hear the gurgling rumble of their stomachs. He could smell the musty odor of their bodies and see the cloud of black flies buzzing around their heads. Please stop here and answer question one. Ram's eyes followed the slow-moving giants, a low guttural growl coming from deep within his throat. The boy held him tight by the scruff of the neck and the wolf dog strained until his breathing was almost choked. Tao could feel Ram's body trembling with excitement. No, Ram, he whispered, they are too big. You would have no chance against the monsters. The mammoths kept coming and coming and now they seemed to be everywhere. Then Tao heard sounds behind him, sounds of breaking reeds and sloshing water, sounds of heavy bodies splashing through the swamp. He was no longer downwind. He was no longer safe. They were all around him. Suddenly, one of the lead cows caught the man's scent and sounded the alarm. Long, snake-like trunks swept overhead searching for the danger. Trumpeting shrieks filled the air. Hurriedly, the calves and yearlings moved into the center of the herd. The shrieks and squeals and the thundering bodies were everywhere. Ram tugged and squirmed, and before Tao could stop him, he pulled away and dashed straight into the milling herd. Stop, Ram, stop, Tao shouted, but it was too late. Already the wolf dog was leaping and snapping at the legs of the nearest beast. Tao cried out, shouting again and again, trying to make himself heard, but his voice was drowned out by pounding feet and wild screams. He stood by helplessly as he saw the wolf dog dart from one angry animal to another, dashing between them, nipping at their legs. With amazing quickness, the big animals whirled around, lashing out, striking back at this annoying pest. Two or three times, Tao saw Ram disappeared into a jumble of legs and trunks, any minute expecting him to be thrown into the air or impaled on a long curved tusk. 
Once the wolf dog was caught by a swinging trunk and sent sprawling into the swamp grass, but Ram was quick. He leapt to his feet and charged again, snapping, jumping, dodging out of the way, almost toying with the enraged beast as the boy looked on in horror. Please stop here and answer question two. Noises filled the swamp. Reeds cracked. The great beasts were crashing through. Tao could feel the earth shake. Wild trumpeting filled his ears and he heard the slogging footsteps behind him. Slowly, he started to back out of the swamp, but the reed grass grew high overhead and he could not see the angry monsters floundering all around him. He could only hear them sloshing through the water, coming closer and closer. He waited silently, hoping they would turn back or go their own way, but the sounds only grew louder. One step at a time, he backed away through the tall grass as the plodding beasts came on. With a sinking feeling, he realized that one of the big cows was following him. Tao stood perfectly still, listening to the heavy footsteps and the pounding of his heart. She's there, he thought, and she knows I am waiting. Then he saw the reeds bend and crack, and he heard the splash of water as the animal broke through the tall grass. A huge cow loomed up over him, standing like a dark shadow, water dripping from her long, reddish-brown hair. Tao's eyes were wide with fright. She was much bigger than he expected. Her great shaggy head clung, hung over him. Sharp, curving tusks glistened in the sunlight. She lifted her trunk and let out an ear-splitting scream of anger. Tao whirled around. There was no place to run. He stepped back, recklessly trying to force his way through the reeds. The jagged edges scratched his bare arms. For a long moment, the monster towered over him, a low, rumbling, rumbling growl coming from deep within her chest. The boy stumbled backwards, falling into the reeds. He got up quickly, dripping swamp water from his arms and face. At that moment, the mammoth charged. With a wild shriek, she lunged at him, stomping, splashing through the water, kicking up showers of slime and mud. Tao dropped his spear. He threw up his arms to protect his face as the hairy giant came on. A long trunk reached out and gripped him around the waist. It lifted him bodily up into the air, then threw him crashing into the reed grass. With the wind knocked out of him, Tao lay in the murky water, trying to catch his breath. He felt stabs of pain. His arms and legs were cut and bleeding. Slowly, he rolled over on his back at the stagnant water rash washed about his shoulders. He looked up and saw the tops of the reed grass waving overhead. He started to get up. Then, with a feeling of awesome terror, he saw the great beast standing above him. Her legs were like hairy logs as she lifted one giant foot and held it over him. She started to bring it down. Tao rolled out of the way just as a foot splashed in the water beside him, but the angry brute lifted her foot again. Tao looked up at the cracked, leathery sole about to come down on his head. Just then, he saw a flash of gray fur plunge into the reeds. It was Ram, flinging himself at the raging mammoth. He badgered her, harassed her, nipping at her legs. She spun around, lashing back at him, but Ram leapt and dodged, staying clear out of her swinging truck. Tao lay still for a moment, his eyes wide with fear. Slowly, he started to get up, his fingers groping for his spear. Just as he got to his feet, the mammoth turned again to face him. With a loud shriek, she started to charge. But the beat, great beast never reached him. Out of the corner of her eye, she saw the wolf dog chasing her calf, which had come up behind her. Instantly, she whirled around and went crashing through the reeds after them. Mud splattered and tired, Tao stood in the tall reeds, waiting, listening, afraid to move. Slowly, the sound of the thundering herd rumbled off into the distance. When he was sure it was safe, Tao began washing the dirt and mud from his arms and legs, still bleeding from the cuts and scratches of the sharp reed grass. Painfully, he leap, limped out of the swamp. In the distance, he could see the rising cloud of the dust, and he knew the great herd had reformed and was continuing on its way. With an uneasy feeling, Tao followed the tracks of the wandering beast, hoping he would not find Ram trampled in the dust. He had not gone far when he saw the wolf dog lopping toward him through the meadow, his sides heaving, his tongue hanging. He was wet. His gray coat caked with mud. Tao threw his arms around the animal's neck, burying his face in wet fur. You are brave, Ram, he said, but you are foolish. The mammoths are not rabbits. They are dangerous. Ram's eyes were bright, and he was panting heavily from his wild run. This time I was lucky, said Tao. You saved my life. Never again will I let you chase the mountains that walk. Please stop here and answer question three. Chapter 11 Tao's cuts and bruises were painful, but not serious. Kala gave him plantain leaves and a poultice made of earth apple to put on his wounds. 
She also gave him a sack full of chestnuts to boost his spirits. Tao smiled at her. It has been a long time since I have had one of these. Kala shook her gray head. If you go on chasing the mammoths, you will not live long enough to eat them. We stop here and answer question four. Summer came and a bright sun filled the valley with its warm glow. Tao watched the golden eagles soaring on the warm updrafts, their sharp eyes searching for rabbits and marmots. The antelopes now share the valley with herds of small shaggy ponies or tarpans not bigger than a wolf dog. One afternoon, as Tao was coming back from the slough with Ram, he looked up to see a rainbow of colors rippling across the white cliffs. Splashes of yellow gave way to blues and purples as the sun moved in and out of the clouds. Then suddenly, he saw a bright flash of white come of light, white light come from the top of the limestone cliff. For a moment, it danced and flickered on the sunshine. Tao shook his head, puzzled, wondering what that what would make such a strange light. A moment later, he saw it again. It sparkled and shone like a star, beckoning him. He walked across the open field, and each time he saw it, he stopped and tried to think where he had seen that light before. When he reached the foot of the cliffs, he stood quietly watching it as it flashed on and off in the sunlight. Then, all at once, it came back to him, and he knew what it was. It was a shining stone. A broad smile crossed his face. He forgot about everything else and started to run. Come, Ram, he shouted, pointing at the top of the cliffs. It is our good friend Greybeard. He is making his magic. Halfway up the cliff, Tao stopped at his little cave. There, he tied his spear over his shoulder with a leather thong. He picked up the bag of chestnuts and tucked it under his belt. Then he started to climb as Ram followed. They went up a narrow and winding ledge, picking their way over the jumbles of loose rock and stones. Soon, the path became steeper. Tao reached out, gasped grasping the stunted pine shrubs that grew from the crevices along the rock wall. He stepped on jutting rocks, and his fingers felt for cracks and crannies to pull himself up. Ram was a good climber, but at some places his paw slipped and scraped on the uneven surface. Once, Tao helped him around an overhang, and twice he had to pull him up by the scruff of the neck. Frequently, they stopped to rest, and little by little, they made their way up the steep limestone wall. As they came closer, Tao saw Greybeard's wrinkled face looking down over the edge of the cliff. He wondered how the old man had made such a difficult climb. Breathing hard, Tao pushed Ram up over the top and pulled himself up the rest of the way. Greybeard reached down with a bony hand and helped the boy to his feet. He was smiling broadly. You saw the light from far off and you knew it was the shining stone? Yes, said Tao, glancing into the old man's blue eyes. Your magic is good, but it is hard to climb even for a boy. That is why I chose this place, said Greybeard. But there is an easier way. I will show you later. He led Tao over to a clump of bushes. There, the old man removing a covering of pine branches to reveal a small opening leading underground. It is well hidden, said the man. No one will find us here. They followed a narrow tunnel down into the cavern, where the shafts of sunlight filtered through from above. Tao saw the unmarked walls and the high arched roof. On the floor were sticks of charcoal together with chunks of dried clay. A surge of excitement raced through him and he felt a new wave of joy. To become an image maker was the thing he had always dreamed of. To be taught by the master was more than he had ever hoped for. My hands and my eyes are ready to begin, he said. Ah, my friend, do not be in such a hurry, the old man bent over, stifling a cough. Then he continued, <clears throat> you will be a better pupil after we have eaten. Tao forced a smile. Food meant nothing to him now, but he did not wish to press the old man. He took the bag of chestnuts from his belt and handed it to Greybeard. Kala gave me these, he said. I have been saving them from you. Please stop here and answer question five. Greybeard opened the skin sack and peered in. He took out one of the shiny red nuts and held it up in his thin finger, smiling. Chestnuts are not plentiful, he said. It will be good to taste them again. They sat on the floor of the cave and ate part of the roasted antelope leg that Greybeard had brought with him. They roasted the chestnuts and cracked them open between two stones and picked out the sweet meat. Ram gnarled a nod on the bone, like leg bone, which still had some meat on it, then curled up in the corner and went to sleep. Bright sunlight came through the opening and reflected off the ash-gray walls of the cavern. Greybeard got to his feet. He lifted his thin arms over his head and stretched. Then he looked down at the boy. 
Now it is time to begin, he said. He took a slate stone from his deerskin pouch. When we were together before, I showed you how to rough out your image, how to draw a bison. Now you must try something harder. He handed Tao the stone. Tao took it and studied the carved engraving. It was a figure of a reindeer with branching antlers and long, thin legs. He knew it would not be easy. He picked up one of the chalks and stepped to the wall. It was clean and unmarked, and he ran the palms of his hands over the surface, feeling the smoothness of it. Then he lifted his other hand and made the first bold strokes, starting with the shoulder and back. The old man stopped him immediately, shaking his head briskly. That is wrong. I have told you. Always make your first sketch in charcoal. Black is better. And start with the outline of the body and the head. Tao groaned inwardly. In his excitement, he had already forgotten the first lesson the old man had taught him. He picked up a stick of charcoal and began again. The old master watched for a while, then reached out and stopped the boy's hand again. No, he said sharply. You draw with short, choppy strokes. Let your hand go free. Let it glide over the wall. There is plenty of room. Reach out as far as you can. As he followed Greybeard's instructions, Tao found he was drawing easier, faster. He smiled with a quick feeling of satisfaction. Just a few words from the master made a big difference. Greybeard nodded. You are learning, my friend. It takes time, but you are learning. Tao drew the outline of two more reindeer before the old man stopped him again. Now I will show you something else, said Greybeard. He took another graven stone from his leather pouch and handed it to Tao. On it was a sketch of a rhino. Then he brushed his long fingers across the wall. Look here, he said. When you draw the rhino, use this bulge as the high part of the back. The hollow place below it then becomes the dark area where the head meets the shoulder. Tao did as he was told, outlining the large rhino. When he had finished, he stepped back, his dark eyes wide with wonder. Look, he said, it begins to live. Greybeard picked up the charcoal. Now, if you wish to show many animals together, you outline the first one, then draw a row of heads and legs, one after another. Greybeard sketched a bison on the wall, then drew a series of heads and legs close behind it. Again, Tao was surprised. With a few quick strokes, the old master had created an, an entire herd of bison. He could almost see the flashing eyes and hear the pounding hooves. It is magic, he said. Now I will try. The old man shook his head. He walked about the little cavern, stretching his arms over his head. That is enough for now. Tomorrow I must go to the camp of the lake people. When I return, I will show you how to make paint and mix colors. For that, we will need some fish oil, some animal fat and blood, and some eggs and honey. The following morning, Greybeard took Tao West along the tops of the cliffs until they came to the narrow path leading down to the bottom. It is not so steep, said the old man, and much easier to climb. They walked across the valley until they came to the river. When they were ready to part, the boy said, Thank you, Greybeard. I will work hard to make the bison live on the cave wall. Then someday, maybe I will be nearly as good as you are. The old man smiled, tugging at his beard. Maybe better, he said. No one can be better, but I will try. The old man walked away, coughing heavily. Tao called after him. Will you be back soon? Do not be impatient, said Greybeard. Tao caught the flicker of a smile. You have enough to do while I am gone. In the days that follow, Tao practiced his drawings. In between, he collected materials for the next lesson. He searched along the dry stream beds for saucer-shaped stones that could be used to mix paints. He scooped wet clay out of the brook and wrapped it in fresh green leaves to keep it moist and soft. Down at the slough, he caught two big fat carp and brought them back to the cave, where he baked them over an open fire and squeezed out the oil. Kala gave him a large seashell, three duck eggs, and a jackal skull full of honey. When everything was ready, he stored them in the hidden cave at the top of the cliff to wait for Greybeard's return. They still needed some animal fat and blood, and one day near the edge of the swamp, Ram picked up the scent of a boar. He tracked it into the spruce forest, where he brought it to the bay in the middle of the berry thicket. It fought viciously, twisting and lashing out with its tusks. Tao drew his spear with all his strength. The boar squealed and thrashed about, then lay still. After he skinned the animal, Tao scraped out as much of the fat and collected some of the blood in a hollow bone. He cut off the head and the best parts of the meat and tied it together in the skin and brought it back to the hidden cave. 
There he stored the blood and fat away to be used for the mixing of the paints. The meat and the rest of the animal he brought back to Kala and the clan people. Please stop here and answer question 7. Soon the odor of roast pig drifted through the little camp as the women speared the legs and ribs on spits and turned them over the open fire. The people were pleased, for it was not often that they were treated to such tasty fare. Even Volt was more friendly. He gave Tao the tusk from the boar's skull to wear around his neck as an amulet and as a token of his hunting skill. Please stop here and answer question 8. Tao was happy to please Volt, and even Garth. He wished he could tell Volt about Ram and how the wolf dog could hunt, but he knew the leader would not listen, so he held his tongue. Yet he wished that someday Ram could show his worth in front of the entire clan. Then maybe Volt would know that the wolf dog was not an evil spirit. Please stop here and answer question 9.